Sunday Conversation, Brian Newbert, Tom Deanhart join me. I want to thank our sponsor, and that's, of course, the Purdue Union Club Hotel. And uh, busy and uh, up, up and running, so to speak, uh, with the 811 restaurant, the Boiler Up Bar, and refurbished rooms, an opportunity for folks that are visiting campus and uh, looking for a place to eat uh, inside, uh, an excellent uh, option, certainly for folks doing that. Guys, uh, you know, we're fresh off now, the, the I, what would be, I guess, the third schedule that Purdue's ha- had to deal with so far. The Boilermakers uh, uh, announced uh, on, on Fox on Saturday morning, kind of rolled it out a little bit at a time, but uh, Tom, I'll get. I'll start with you. Your first impressions of of what you see in terms of who the Boilermakers have to face starting the weekend of October twenty fourth. Yeah, guys, it looks like a pretty manageable slate in my mind um, uh, for Purdue opening against Iowa at home. Of course, they beat the Hawkeyes the last time they visited um, Ross Age Stadium in a thriller. So uh, yeah, and, you know, also last time we saw the Purdue schedule, they had that game at Michigan. Uh, we saw the 10-game conference-only schedule that came out in August. So Michigan has been scrubbed. Uh, Rutgers remains as a home game. So you know, overall, I think Purdue has to be pretty pleased, uh, you know, with, with how this schedule came out. You never want to take anybody for granted, obviously. But again, it looks very manageable. And you know what, guys? Uh, is it going out on a limb to maybe hope Purdue can maybe get to off to a 2-0 start? You know, Iowa then add Illinois. Um, be a great way to start the year before you have to go to Wisconsin for that third game. And, of course, guys, Wisconsin's a team that's beaten Purdue 14 times in a row. The last time Purdue beat the Badgers was way back in 2003, which just happened to be in Man. Uh, you know, again, yeah, Rutgers at home and the fact that uh, you have Nebraska at home, though that's later in the year, and you switch basically Nebraska for home. Wisconsin, which was originally scheduled to be a home game, now is on the road. Uh, your impressions? I'd love to tell you my impressions, but my Wi-Fi seems to be cutting in and out here, uh, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Xfinity, for your, your the fine consistency <laughs> of your product. So Tom just turned into a painting uh, for a few minutes and I didn't hear your question. So if you want to. Okay. Well, that, no, the question is your impressions, the fact that Purdue and you didn't break up on my end, at least not from what I could tell, but uh, Purdue obviously, uh, you know, going to trade now a, a going to bring the Nebraska to West Lafayette. We'll go to Wisconsin. That's uh, one change, I guess, if you look at it that way. And the fact that you have Rutgers, uh, and not Michigan, uh, but what are your impressions of the schedule on the surface, uh, and, and maybe how the how it lines up in terms of week to week? You know, game, it's kind of the old Gene Cady. You know, it's not who you put when you who you play; it's when you play them, so to speak. Uh, any any challenges that uh, you see from that standpoint that would make it extra difficult for Purdue? Um, I think you caught breaks. I mean, obviously, I, I think that's pretty apparent. Getting Rutgers on the schedule instead of Michigan. Any Big Ten season where you don't have Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, or Penn State, you know, there's no such thing as an easy Big Ten schedule, but the closest thing to an easy Big Ten schedule would be void of those teams. Uh, I think getting through those first three games where you have to play Iowa and then you have to go to Wisconsin with that trip to Illinois in between, obviously you'd like to get off to a good start. Um, I think you're going to have – I think you're going to save some money on travel because two of your <laughs> – at least two of your four road trips are bus trips. Uh not that that's the not that that's the prime consideration here. I thought you, you caught a break bringing Nebraska to Purdue instead of going to Nebraska. Whether home field advantage matters one bit this season, I have no idea. Uh, yeah. But I think that is something that at least jumps off the page here. We will see how good Iowa is. We will see how good Minnesota turns out to be. Um, we will see how good Indiana turns out to be. That's where kind of the kind of the variance is in all of this. You know, Purdue has shown before it can really compete with Iowa getting them at home to start the season. If you can win that one, you can go to Illinois, beat an Illinois team that shouldn't be any good, but one that you lost to most recently. Um, hard to win in Madison, but if you can get off to a 2-1 and one start there over those first three games, you might be, you might be sitting pretty here for a, a chance to have a pretty decent season. That said, I've said all along that, that this season's going to be – could potentially be chaos. You know, outcomes may be determined by 
you know, uh, COVID outbreak. So it could be completely random how the, all of this stuff shakes out for all of these teams, but at least on paper, based on what we would consider under normal circumstances, this looks like as manageable a Big Ten schedule as you possibly could have hoped for. Yeah, Tom, at least you're not going to Minnesota on December the 12th. Uh, I think that might be a good thing. Uh, I don't even know. I didn't look at Minnesota's schedule close enough to know if the Gophers are even at home the last – I assume they are one of the last two weeks. But you might, uh, you know, having a December 5th home game against Nebraska, that's uh, – you know, you might have a balmy, beautiful day. I remember that was the same day Jeff Brom was hired back in 2016, and it was a gorgeous day. So who knows what the weather will bring. None of that really seems to matter. Uh, the fact that you're going to play eight games in eight weeks uh, does matter, and that's what's going to be interesting. Yeah, you're right, Alan. Looking at the schedule, the game at Wisconsin, the game at Minnesota, looked to be the most daunting. I talked about Purdue's struggles with the Badgers going back, what, 20 years. Minnesota's really had Purdue's number uh, of late as well, uh, winning six of the last seven games. And Purdue hasn't won in Minneapolis since 2007. It's never won in the new TFC Bank Stadium. So that's going to be a big bellwether game. We know those are two programs sort of trying to crawl over each other in the pecking order in the Big Ten West. So that, that's going to be interesting. But, you know, guys, other than, again, that trip to Madison, the trip to Minneapolis, um, the other games, boy, you really like Purdue's chances. Again, like Brian said, though, will road games really even matter this year? Yeah. I mean, there's going to be no fans in the stands. So uh, we're so conditioned to worry about, worrying about road games. But, again, that whole dynamic may be out the window. And, again, as Brian said, wow, for Purdue to avoid all those Big Ten East elite teams was quite a bonus. I mean, look at Nebraska, guys. They get to open – uh, against Ohio State. Then they play Wisconsin, and they also have a game with Penn State. So some other teams have a lot more heavy lifting than Purdue. So, again, if you're Brom, uh, you really have to be pleased uh, with your to-do list, so to speak, for 2020. Yeah. You know, you look at uh, the Big Ten, Brian, and uh, Ohio State obviously is the is anointed as the team that uh, will be most likely to make the college football play up. Penn State may be in the mix, maybe Michigan, who knows, maybe Wisconsin. The Buckeyes have a, have a uh, looks to be a good, good schedule as well. Of course, they don't playing themselves, so to speak, so that helps. But, you know, it's, it's just, uh, and yet you have to also, you, you can't prepare for this, but uh, you, you, like you said, you may not have. You may play six games. You may play seven games. That's uh, yeah. all part of this X factor as we look look at that uh, 2020 schedule number three. Yeah, and let's talk for a second about other X factors. We talked about whether or not home field advantage might matter or not. Um, I'll go back to something Elliot Bloom said on our television show yesterday about road competition this year. And I covered a high school football game a couple weeks ago where at halftime, a team from Cincinnati with a really robust roster. Half of its team went in the locker room for halftime and the other half of its team sat in a grass field next to the locker room. Right. There are going to be considerable pains in the, in the neck about, you know, travel accommodations, road accommodations, things aren't going to be normal. And whoever deals with that kind of nuisance, that kind of pain in the neck, that kind of hassle the best is going to, you know, probably have an advantage. And what we've seen, obviously, in the Big Ten uh, over the years, Ohio State comes to Purdue and gets blitzed. Mm -hmm. Gets blitzed a lot. Circumstance plays into that stuff sometimes. And, you know, who knows what this is going to be like when Ohio State comes to a place with a really small visitor's locker room, has to deal with all kinds of logistical problems in just having the game. You know, who knows what's going to happen if somebody gets a couple positive COVID tests a few days before the game. You know, that's where this season's a complete unknown. Again, just kind of looking back at what we think we know about these teams on paper, if things are normal, I would think Ohio State would, would, run, would run roughshod over the conference again. But, you know, as I said, this is going to be the most randomized set of results probably in the history of college football this year. Tom, does it make it more interesting to cover? I mean, I mean, in its own bizarre way, yeah, you, you just there's no predictor here. Yeah, exactly right, Alan. You talk about wild cards, dynamics, X factors, unknowns. I mean, you can go on and on with trying to get your or wrap your arms around what this season could look like. I mean, Brian laid out some of the those X factors and 
And boy, we just don't know how any of this is going to impact these rosters. You know, for the last month or so, when, when you talk to coaches and, and, and just to other people, you read stories, most people seem to think if you've got a, a senior laden team with great leadership, and that's obviously going to help you navigate some of these unknowns to keep all the players on track. I mean, how many times have we heard coaches say the best teams are teams they never really had to lead, they led themselves. So that, that should speak well to teams this year, again, that have strong leaders and maybe, you know, really uh, powerful senior classes in particular to deal with some of these unknowns because this, this dynamic could change week to week. I'd like to think the Big Ten and its testing procedures – overall are going to make for pretty smooth sailing as far as rosters go and, and, and lack of attrition. I could be wrong. Again, everybody's going to have to be ready for a season that uh, so far has been a roller coaster and we could just be getting started with some more crazy twists and turns on that roller coaster too. Another one of those twists and turns, obviously, Brian, will be Rondale Moore. We've talked a little bit about that since the Big Ten's announcements this past Wednesday. You know, another storyline – a huge X factor for Purdue because he could solve some, some problems and <laughs> this is stating the obvious. He could solve problems in special teams. He could solve problems just uh, from with your offense, having him on the field. We may have to be patient. We're going to have to be patient at least as of this recording that uh, uh, no decision has been made yet at public, but uh, it could be a big, big coup for Purdue if he gets back. Yeah. Obviously Purdue has a lot of good wide receivers with or without him, but obviously yeah. You would like to have one of college football's elite offensive players on your side. That's that that kind of goes without saying. You know, his focus is on the NFL, and it, it, it's perfectly reasonable that his focus is on the NFL. But playing this season could fit into that overall uh, into that overall picture. It could help him to get a couple of games under his belt. Mm -hmm. You know, to show that he is uh, he is the player everybody last saw <clears throat> pretty much a year ago. Um, he could just be bored. He could just want to compete too. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I would think it, it's very much within the realm of possibility. It's something he'll consider doing whether or not I would consider it a probability or just a possibility. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. but it, it does seem like it's at least on his radar. It, it's certainly on Jeff Brom's radar to try to make it happen. You are seeing a lot of these guys who've opted out, opt back in. Uh, I'd imagine a few of them are getting, we're starting to get antsy. A few of them were, you know, starting, starting to get the itch to compete. The logistics of it could be, you know, um, I have no idea how that would work. You know, I, he's, he doesn't have an agent, um, so I don't know if there's anything really to unravel there. Uh, but he did opt out before the season um, was postponed. But I don't know if that's an issue without the, the agent part of it or <clears throat> without the compensation part of it. So it could be as simple as him just showing back up on campus and showing up for practice the first day. He's still in school. He's on, taking online classes. I don't know what the hurdles would be other than simply whether he wants to do it or not. But so I guess we'll just kind of have to wait and see whether he wants to do it or not. Yeah. But Tom, you know, obviously some guys have made, you know, Rashad Bateman has, has, and a couple others have made pronouncements. Rondale hasn't. I don't know what to read into that and maybe nothing at this point, but uh, You'll wait for him if you're Purdue, certainly. <laughs> you're going to be happy to take a guy like that back. Rondell could show up an hour before kickoff on October 24th, <laughs> Allen, and uh, I'd let him buckle his chin strap and send him right to the field. I mean, without a doubt. We talked about, you know, no more dynamic player in school history other than maybe Leroy Keyes, so I don't think that's an overstatement. Yeah, you know, we, we've seen the, uh, the, you know, the pronouncements from the Sean Wades, the, the Wyatt Davises, the Rashad Batemans, among others, just within the Big Ten about wanting to come back. Some are back. Bateman's trying to clear some hurdles. Bateman was the first Big Ten player to opt out, if you recall. But P.J. Flexman, public, too, they're trying to work through the dynamics of getting him cleared to play. It's e the Ohio State guys, it's easier. The Northwestern offensive tackle, Rashad, Rashawn Slater, is not coming back. So who knows? Uh, the Moore camp has been silent uh, since all this news broke Wednesday. Brian talked about Jeff Brom. We talked to him this week. Of course, Jeff would welcome Rondale back with open arms, but he said he's content with whatever decision Rondale makes. So, uh, you know, we're still hoping and waiting. Uh, maybe we won't hear from Moore at all, but again, um, uh, I guess there's no hurry. 
Uh, practice really won't begin in earnest in full pass till September 30th. But boy, if you're Brom and Purdue and a fan, you'd like to know, boy, number four is going to be back because you couple his return with that schedule, and it's it's not crazy to envision that team winning six games this year. Who knows, maybe seven. Yeah. And there's uh, probably not a college football player in the country who's in better shape than Rondell Moore right now either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Because believe that he's not had any practice restrictions. He's not had any workout restrictions. He's been training all day, every day. Unreal. Just an unreal that. specimen. Just unreal. Yeah, mm. and, and in the world, the world of uh, – and this is overly simplified, Brian, but player empowerment, you know, it still is – Guys are waiting. It's it's all about for some of the guys, for the elite players. It's a business decision, uh, and yet uh, for a lot of the ones that just want to get on the field, also you know, like the Lorenzo Neals of the world uh, that have uh, aspirations of playing at, at the league at the at the next level, but may need to showcase. It's just an interesting time, interesting dynamic to have these options available out there for for um, these kids in a in a COVID world. Yeah, I mean, it is these are business. These are business decisions nowadays for kids of a certain level, as they should be. I mean, I just heard Urban yeah. Meyer on on Fox talking about the Nick Bosa decision years ago where his dad called him or walked into his office and said, Coach, $30 million. And <laughs> Urban Meyer's like, I get it. I, yeah. You know, it breaks my heart, but I get it. I mean, who in their right mind, who in their good conscience could ever say, you, you need to continue to play for your college team instead of your focus being on setting yourself up financially for life for – materializing exactly what you've always dreamed of. What is kind of not as interesting now as it, as it would have been had the Big Ten, you know, played in the winter or the spring is that you have a lot of these more fringe type NFL guys, guys who are probably going to get drafted, but they're not the certainties that a Rondell Moore would be, who now have no reason not to play. Uh, all of your seniors now are going to have a season that fits into the tr traditional window their, their, their NFL prep won't be, won't be disrupted at all. Had this gone into the winter, had this gone into the spring, you would have seen mass exoduses. You would have seen seniors left and right, probably guys who might be six-round picks, even sitting out just to make sure they don't turn their ankle really badly in the last game of the year, uh, you know, a couple weeks before their NFL, uh, their NFL training would begin. Um, so there should be some normalcy there. I don't necessarily know if, if really the opt-out stuff would apply as much to anybody but the really elite kids. Yeah. Um, the season will be normal, so I think a lot of that stuff for the kind of the rank-and-file NFL prospect is sort of off the table. Yeah, one quick thing too, Tom, they, they also talked about the fact that the Batemans, if Rondell Moore comes back and, and – Purdue starts 0 and 3. You know, those, those guys can change their minds too. I mean, again, that's the that's the world we're in. Or, or if there is some level of uncomfortableness by by those elite players, you may see them change if if their schedule or if their teams don't perform or if there's another factor. Yeah, I was thinking about that when Brian was talking. I wanted to raise that point. I'm glad you did, Alan. You're exactly right. We've discussed that. We've read about it. Um, yeah, again, there could be a star player at Michigan. All gung ho. They start off 0 and 2, 0 and 3, 1 and 1 and 2. He could just say, "Look, it's it's been great, but I'm out of here, guys. We aren't going to win the Big Ten this year. We're not going to get the college football playoff. I gave it a crack. I'm just going to go train for the National Football League." So, you know, I know I know some fans really are disturbed by by, by guys looking out for themselves, but I guess I, I I'm well past that. I like Brian said. I understand. It's you know, we all want to play for good old state U, but I mean, you got one chance to make a lot of money playing football. You're only 22 years old once. You got to do it. So, um, is it selfish? Yeah, but you know, we're all selfish. We're all looking out for the best of us. We want to be team players. We are, but you know, that that's a lot of money, and you got to look out for yourself. So, just another dynamic for this year. But guys, again, if I'm a player. This is a season I like. I really don't want to play in the winter or spring. But man, you're gonna give me eight games in the traditional football season, the chance to get the college football playoff, the chance to go to a bowl game, the chance to play at least in my home stadium. No fans, but still, considering where we were at just two, three, four weeks ago, this is great, I think. Yeah, interesting uh, uh, dynamic and interesting time and a story that it will be a weekly discussion, uh, not only on this show, but one other uh, on quick other point things. To make Brian, up. go ahead. Yeah, one other quick point to make about opt-outs and opt-ins and, and all that stuff is what will be interesting to see is if 
you know, all of the considerations that have had to be mulled over by a lot of these players under these unique circumstances don't become a gateway to this becoming something more of a normal yeah, you're under right. traditional circumstances. You yeah, know, there was some talk a few years ago about, you know, Trevor Lawrence at Clemson that he was such a surefire NFL guy, the best quarterback prospect since Andrew Luck. A lot of people called him. What, yeah. whether it was an option for him to just lay out and train for a year and just wait for the draft. And it is entirely plausible what you're seeing, like with, with high school basketball players in the NBA, a lot of them going to the G league instead. It is entirely plausible. You might see that because the, 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 the chances for catastrophic injury in football are obviously considerable. The shelf life for a football player is obviously shorter. And um, it just, it does make some business sense at times for the right kid in the right situation to say, you know what, I just, I have so much to lose in this situation that it might just not be worth it for me to play my junior season. So I'm going to lay out and I'm going to go to the draft instead. And now those kind of considerations have been thrust to the forefront in a lot of guys' minds. And as we've talked about, you know, more and more in college basketball and college football, the, the, the decisions players and their families and their, their, their people make being more based on business, you know, it is entirely possible this becomes a gateway to another changing normal here. A segue to uh, our last topic, and uh, Harrison Ingram makes his decision on Friday afternoon at five, right around five o'clock Eastern time, uh, decides Stanford uh, over uh, Purdue, North Carolina, Michigan, and other schools. Uh, here's a guy that's uh, in, an NBA guy, at least it sure looks that way, going to a, obviously hard to argue the institution he chose. Um, your impressions, Brian, uh, when this uh, came down, we, you know, we followed this as close as anybody in the country. Uh, Purdue was definitely recruited him well, but just not well enough. Well, they did a hell of a job getting to where they got. Um, it was Purdue and Stanford all along. And, uh, you know, he almost committed to Stanford after his visit didn't almost committed to Purdue after his visit didn't. And then right. it was, it was Purdue and Stanford all along. You have to give the kid credit too, for not for sticking with the people who stuck with him and all of that stuff. You know, I, it's hard to recruit against Stanford because Stanford can recruit a certain level of kid for which what Stanford is strong in has really, really resonates. And what you've seen is Stanford be able to leverage its prestige into a couple of really, really high end basketball recruits here the last couple of years produce track record over the years in football, basketball, whatever it may be, recruiting against Stanford is not very good uh, for that reason because Stanford is, <clears throat> is a really, really formidable institution. From a basketball perspective, you know, it, it did surprise me a little bit because this is a player who wants to make a name for himself. This is a player who wants to be seen. This is a player who wants to be a star. Uh, in, the, in the Bay Area media market, nobody's going to pay attention to you in the, in the um, Pacific time zone, three quarters of the country is not going to see you play and the fans don't care. Uh, that, that's simply the reality of playing at Stanford. Still, uh, Stanford did a great job recruiting him. Stanford appealed to him academically. The guard they have committed uh, there, the, the really, really blue chip guard they have committed really, really mattered in this. I think, I think Harrison Ingram was comfortable with him, wanted to play with him. And I think that mattered as well. Uh, but Purdue got right to the doorstep of, what would have been a breakthrough level recruit, but, um, you know, uh, just came up short. Uh, I, I was told several weeks ago, this was the best piece of information I got during the whole thing that Purdue was either going to get him or they were going to finish a close second to Stanford. And the latter scenario is exactly what happened, but Purdue still has a, a great player committed to them in Caleb first. Purdue still has a great chance to get Trey Kaufman. I think who's another great player, a top 35 player in the country now. And Purdue has really good young players in its program. And, you know, Purdue's going to be fine here. Um, that's simply the reality of it. Purdue is recruiting at the highest level it's ever recruited at under Matt Painter. And I think the fact that they almost got a five-star uh, top 10 player nationally from Dallas, you know, speaks to the pull Purdue has right now. Makes no sense to me why he picks Stanford. I get the academics, but what, is he going to be there for one year? It's not like he's going to be there for four years, but – Right. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The book is closed. Uh, the final chapter has been penned on Harrison Ingram. Good luck. Brian talked about Trey Kaufman, but you know there was some other big basketball news this week too, Brian. Talk a little bit about the decision made, or I guess finalized for the start of the season when practice can start. Yeah. And I guess when you – even any scheduling tidbits you may know about right now, because I know you talked to Coach Painter this week too. 
Yeah, it was, uh, you know, Wednesday's big reveal, or was it Wednesday or Tuesday? It was Tuesday. Wednesday. 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 Whatever. It all runs together. <laughs> yeah. um, that big reveal that day was kind of, kind of anticlimactic because there just wasn't a whole lot to it. What they announced was the season can start November 25th. You can play no more than 27 regular season games, no fewer than 13, and practice starts October 14th. Nobody knows who's playing who. Uh, what has to happen now for Purdue is the Big Ten has to determine, are we having a 20-game season? Are we having a 22-game season? Are we having a 26-game season? Uh, they're not going to have – I don't think they're going to have a 26-game season anymore. I think that would have been an option under certain cir- circumstances. But I think the Big Ten will probably end up playing a traditional 20-game season, and then Purdue will have to just figure out its non-conference season, which should be six or seven games. Uh, I know they want to have the Big Ten ACC Challenge. I know they want to have the Gavit Games. I don't know about the Cancun Challenge. I don't know about the West Virginia game. I don't know about the Crossroads Classic, but you would like to get as many really good games in there as possible. So that process kind of starts now. Really all it was on Tuesday was a jumping off point Mm -hmm. saying you can start on this date and now go figure it out. And there are schools out there trying to organize bubbles. Uh, Louisville's hosting one, trying to get games. Uh, Now on whatever date today is, uh, September 19th, they're trying to schedule games starting November 25th on September 19th. Uh, Duke is trying to host a bubble. Apparently, uh, the Mohegan Sun's trying to host a bubble. There's all sorts of things. All these preseason events are moving around. Uh, so it, it's just, it's like starting over. It's the season <laughs> starting November 25th, but we have no idea what the schedule is actually going to look like other than there's going to be a Big Ten season and an NCAA tournament and a Big Ten tournament. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, again, a lot to develop. All right. Next, uh, looking ahead, obviously, Tom, uh, on your plate uh, will be <laughs> revisiting that schedule yeah. for the third time and maybe analyzing <laughs> that more. But what else what else can readers look forward to this week? Can you believe that the third incarnation of the schedule? I mean, um, just when you think you've seen everything, uh, we get 2020 thrown at us. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a reboot story called that you're pretty rebooting the 2020 season sort of resetting you know where Purdue's at as it as it begins in earnest to prepare for this upcoming season a lot of the obviously the same questions persist but again just trying to get everybody reacclimated with with the roster with the questions as we move forward and like you said Alan I'm um, taking a, a closer look at that schedule as well so uh exciting times guys I mean again we didn't think Maybe this was possible in the fall not that long ago. I remember us talking on the phone back in March, and late mid-March, and just the unknowns, and there's still a lot of unknowns, but it looks like we're starting to figure things out as far as learning how to live with this virus. And for our standpoint, learning, for, for people to learn how to play sports and, and under these conditions too, which is great. Yeah. Brian, your last word. Yeah, I've got some basketball stuff for next week, but as far as I'm concerned, it's Tom's show. Now he's got football back, so I'm just going to uh, – I'm just going to kind of stand down. But what I'm really looking forward to is let's talk about sports again. You know, I'm yeah. I'm so tired of writing my columns every week about COVID-19 and the Big Ten screwing up its postponement of its season and all of the culture war stuff we've had to delve into and all of the people we've pissed off in the process. I'm looking <laughs> forward to talking about offensive tackles and <laughs> backup you know, centers. <laughs> RPOs again. I'm looking forward to talking about, you know, football and basketball and not viruses and social unrest and uh, seasons that aren't going to happen. So l- let's get back to sports. Let's yes. get back to what we got into this to do. Right, that's good. <laughs> that's, we'll end on that. And, I, and let's hope that that's the case uh, uh, for the for the many weeks coming forward all the way to basically to the holidays. Uh, we're, we should have uh, a lot of good sports content, uh, a lot of football content, as well as basketball. Guys, uh, thanks so much. I want to thank our sponsor, and that's Purdue Union Club Hotel. And uh, we enjoy our Sunday conversations, and uh, it'd be, I don't know. I don't know that after games. I guess maybe we'll do them. We'll do those as well. We'll see from a programming standpoint. But uh, guys, have a great rest of the weekend. And again, uh, thanks again to the Purdue Union Club Hotel, and thanks to all of you for listening and watching uh, our Sunday conversation. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>